So my name is Ekop, I'm from Germany, 28 years old and I play Hearthstone. Going through the Swiss stage is obviously always a grind and uh, long and tedious, but it feels super rewarding to manage to get into the tops. I see every opponent um, kind of as the same level of threat. Everyone can beat me, but I can beat everyone as well. So yeah, it's, it's Hearthstone, anything can happen. Yeah, last week I just won a tournament and um, now I'm performing well in this one. So I'm on a roll, I got all the momentum. I thrive on being on the stage, being under, feeling that pressure, uh, all eyes watching, and I just, I just love it. I play to the, towards the crowd, I like to put on a show. Yeah, I just really enjoy it. A message for my opponents, all I have to say is, watch out. I'm Xixo, I play for Na'Vi. I've been into the top eight for all three Insomnia tournaments. But both the last times, I got quite unfortunate in the round of eight, so I never made it past that stage. So I really hope I get further this time. Every Insomni had more players, I think. So I think that every player likes the venue here, likes how it's run, likes the format, which is last year's standing, which we all prefer. But to my opponents, I know they got quite unlucky already queuing into me in the tournament. They could have gotten like way easier opponents. I hope they get slightly more fortunate in the game so they can maybe like take a game against me. Loving the confidence from both players. Sixo almost apologizing for the players having to play him because he feels so confident overall. And I think it's, it's kind of cool that Sixo's just looking to just, you know, add another trophy, so to speak. Like Sixo's been performing really well recently. He just wants yet another, like, you know, major title under his belt. Whereas Ecop's just super hungry for the, like, the first big win, especially this year. So he's coming off the back of a victory himself, though, so not looking too bad at all. We can see the players just getting ready now, and we do have the bands available, and it is going to be Ecop Shaman's band and Sixo's Rogue. What do you guys make of the Rogue ban? Uh, I can kind of get on board with it. The the Rogue is an extremely powerful deck. You know, Sixo's playing decks uh, like Zoo, for example, um, that, that can be uh, pretty dominant for Rogue, and with the addition of Barnes to that deck, which is almost a no-brainer. We were talking about testing before, but honestly, Barnes doesn't even really need that much testing in the deck. Like, it's so obviously powerful. Yep, and we are getting into the first game of the Grand Finals of the Insomnia True Silver Championship. It's going to be Ecop versus Six. So take it away, guys. Okay, thank you very much. And pretty solid opener from here for Ecop straight away with the Fiery War Axe into the Disciple of Cthune. Again, this is uh, the cycle-based version of the Cthoon deck, which really tries to draw through its deck very, very quickly. Drops some mid-game options like Brawl in favor of some more aggressive cycle. Like, how do you how do you like this deck compared in comparison to almost the old version of Cthoon Warrior at this point? I guess. Yeah, I think against Druid I like it more because um, against Druid, Druid doesn't have a way to deal with your Cthoon without killing him, yes. and that means if you can just cycle through your deck. Play this one cartoon, even if Druid has the ability to mulch your one cartoon, he definitely won't be able to survive your second cartoon. No. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, but remember, this is a, a slightly different twist on Druid from, from Sixo. He has the uh, the Gadgetzans, the Moonfires and Malagos in there, trying a more, you know, miracle-based strategy, similar to what Rogues try and do with, uh, with Malagos in the same sort of deck, but... This is the deck that carried him to this point. The semi-final was a, a big victory for him where he came back 0-3 with this deck. Specifically, 3-0 reverse sweeping with Malagos Druid. No, I also heard about some very good Yogs are on action. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, he had a, a Yog that put him right, right at the point of killing him with fatigue and then put a Roaring Torch in his deck just <laughs> to prevent him from dying. It was pretty sick. Okay, so uh, what we see here is also the backhand of evil, so just right in time. Didn't want to play the Disciple, just pinging the face, that's sure. pretty obvious. Druid has a very, very sick mana advantage here. Let's see how we go from there. Yeah, still early for the Gadgetsan. I think even in this deck, in comparison to Mer Miracle Rogue, although you can gain mana so quickly, you need a lot more mana to have an effective Gadgetsan Auctioneer, right? Because you don't have access to a bunch of coins from yep. Tomb Pillagers. You, you do have Innovates, but you often use them to get you ahead, not like hold back on mm -hmm. them to, to combo with the, the Gadgetsan. So generally, Gadgetsan comes down later in the game. So even with that huge mana advantage, it might be a little while before we see the Auctioneer. Yeah, I also guess that the uh, uh, turn for the Auctioneer in the Druid uh, is probably Mana 10. Not turn 10 though, but Mana 10 for the Wild Cross action, so you can play Auctioneer sure. into yeah, Mana yeah, Wild Cross cycle. 
So uh, Wrath here can be used, but he might be considering whether he wants to combine that with his Auctioneer at some point. This 2-3 is... It's not like this 2-3 has a clock on him, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be dealt with right away, but mm -hmm. he's just going to make sure the board is uh, as tidy as possible moving forward. Yeah, but now we also can already see an Emperor coming down here. And the Emperor has to be handled. And that's also very good. Oh, oh actually, we don't see an Emperor <laughs> coming down here. Uh, what do you think about this subtle? I guess this signals that Ecop is is going basically for the full strategy here, which is Brand Doomcaller, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, generally, what this deck tries to do in matchups where it thinks it has time to do it is draw your whole deck till it's almost empty, and then put two Cthoons back yeah. in your deck, draw them really quickly, play them, win the game. So the fact that he's holding off on his Emperor here when it was just a perfect empty board Emperor means that, you know, in Ecop's mind, this is a matchup where he's going to do that. And uh, did you like it? <laughs> I personally, I would slam Empty Board Emperor against Druid every single time. Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah. Because, like, Swipe Hero Power is a huge mana commitment to deal with it, and outside of that, it's like the one mulch, mm -hmm. possibly two mulches in their deck that can deal with it. So, a, yep. a large amount of the time, you get two turns of Emperor in that situation. Right, right, which is pretty insane, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. then you can still make the Doom Caller happen uh, uh, anyways. But, yeah, sure. And so Ecop here is obviously going to have to try and cycle his deck now. If that's the, the line he's committed to, then he needs to push through his deck as quickly as possible because he can't, can't sit back and chill against this deck for too long because it won't be that long until Druid creates a board state that you just can't deal with, right? That's just kind of what they do. They make these ridiculous board states and with no brawl in this deck, like, Pyromancer stuff will only carry you so far once you've run out of executes. Oh, yeah. But the Battle Rage is a pretty good card um, in combination with the Pyro if you can shield them um, later. So, um, yeah. And now here with Slam and Disciple of Cartoon, the perfect answer against the Dragon. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a commanding shout. Well, there we thing. go. Here we go. Yeah, so this is, for, for people who aren't familiar with this deck, this is basically the, the main engine of the deck, if you like, the Pyromancer Commanding Shout. It's it's both a clearing engine and a card draw engine, because it allows you to have a Pyromancer on the board that can't die because of the yep. Commanding Shout effect, and then all the spells that you keep casting keep doing one damage AoE to the board. Then at the same time, the Pyromancer will always be there to be able to activate Battle Rage to draw you cards. Okay, and here we also see that the Emperor save might then discount other combo pieces and then probably just refilling the entire hand with this Bad Rage. That's probably the master plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks pretty solid. Um, but this, as you uh, correctly pointed out on a previous turn, Auctioneer plus Wild Growth on turn 10. This is so great, especially when you draw an Innovate off the Wild Growth. Oh, wow. wow. This is going to be so much cycle here from 6-0. Uh, I think he's going to get to the point where he's going to end up with 10 cards in his hand, though. But that's not going to be a big issue since he'll be able to drop the uh, Arcane Giants at the end of all this to clear oh, some yeah. cards out of his hand. I mean, the Arcan Giant's also very interesting because if he really decides to... Um, I mean, I don't know whether he knows how many brawls Ecop runs, but if he does... Uh, Ecop runs one brawl? Zero? Was Zero, it? I believe. Zero? Uh, ge generally, brawl is replaced by the Pyromancer package in this deck, right? Right, so. right. Because then um, um, Tixo might have the idea to just slam both Giants yep. uh, onto this board. Um, but we already see Eco. Oh yeah, he does. But we already see Ecop having the perfect answer because, um, uh, as you pointed out earlier, the Pyromancer plus every spell will deliver one damage. But if he plays both Pyromancers, every spell will deliver two damage. Yep, and even more so than that, the fact that he's playing two Pyromancers here will mean extra cards from Battle Rage as well. So this is going to be a huge turn for Ecop. Zixo correctly, in my opinion, committed a huge amount of resources to the board because, like I said, outside of executes, you know, Pyro on its own doesn't interact with huge amounts of health that well. But mm -hmm. when there are two of them, which is such a niche situation, you know, Ecop's not that deep yep. in his deck to be yep. entitled to have both Pyromancers and a commanding shout in his hand already. So Zixo has, has made a risk here, but a calculated risk. Ecop does have the punish for him in hand, ready to go. Absolutely. Now here with this battle rage coin but to Iker, it's so insane, it's yep. just silly. Yeah, so coin for two more AoE damage, blood to Ica will be two more AoE, he'll get the extra piece of damage from the Ica itself as well, but that is not relevant and that is gonna be good by giants. And that is a huge chunk of the deck down already because 
a lot of the mid-game threats have been cut out of this deck to make room for the Malagos. Oh, yeah. Right? So his, his ability to keep refilling the board over and over again isn't as powerful as a conventional token druid is. Mm. Absolutely agree there. And this Malagos burst damage is usually also not that powerful against the warrior because warrior obviously has a lot of ways to restore armor or health very quickly. Yeah, especially he's already used one Moonfire to cycle off the Gadgetan yep. Auctioneer as well. So his potential damage output is reduced quite a lot. So, you know, Ecop might just be able to stabilize to the point where he's unkillable here. And if he's able to do that, then his plan to reach the end of his deck, draw all his Cthoons, you know, with yes. what we were talking about at the start, then if he's able to stabilize to that point, then that strategy will just be undefeatable from 6-0, basically. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we see a Wisp Dream taken. Um, fight for cycle, yeah, that's clear. And maybe even playing the Wisps, because you... I mean, even if the Pyromancer can clear them, um, the Wisps will at least also clear this. But yeah, I like Swipe probably more than that. Yeah, I think the, the Swipe is the cleanest play, though. I think the reason he took Wisps is... He's having that, that same feeling that I just talked about, where like he doesn't really have the reload in mm -hmm. his deck anymore, yep. so it feels like uh, Wisps is a potential reload for him. I think there's one Raven Idol left in his deck, so if he can potentially pick up a Synergy card, like Power yep. of the Wild, Soul of the Forest, something like that, be able to make a push using those cards together. Yep, I like it. I mean, that being said, Ikop still has access to Double Goo, so I guess just playing the Wisps as seven moments is, will probably not be that possible for him. Right. But yeah, as you pointed out, Raven, I, uh, did he... You sure that he didn't use already both? I think he, he may have done. Right. One was for the Wild Growth, and the second That's one was... That's right, you're yeah. totally right. Yeah, you're totally right, yeah. All right, so he's going to have to make do with what's in his deck, which, yeah, in that case, makes the Wisps a bit of an unusual choice. He may... I mean, it's not like this This deck has the, the token generation to be able to use it for the buff. So maybe his plan is just like double living roots for, for board and, and buff them with the wisps at this point. Like, where is he finding the board presence to be able to do this? I don't know. Exactly. I mean, the wisp pick, that was definitely fine because the other two cards weren't that good. Sure. Yeah. So that's fine. Yoxaron. Da -da 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 -da. Mark of the <laughs> No, it's serious. I mean, whenever he comes, yeah, I'm just like, yeah, okay, let's let's eat popcorn. I saw some video being made where you have Jania just eating popcorn. I was really laughing about that one. So innovate fireball, yeah, all goodies. And bam, okay, Yoxaron leaves us. But Maelstrom Portal, another one mana and heal and heal. Uh, not exactly, not cut draw with the heal, but I guess good enough. Raven Idol into Panther. Power of the Wild, or what is it? No. To nothing. His hand got filled oh, up by wild growths of the Thistle Team. And it goes away. Embrace the Shadows. <laughs> Not doing man, uh, much, yeah. So that dog probably rather a failure. <laughs> that, that was impressive, I have to say. Like, rap, rap God Life Coach talking you through the, uh, the, the Yogs are on plays. But yeah, not the world's most impressive Yogg for sure. I mean, Wild Growth, probably the worst card he could have hit off the Thistle T as well. Just clogged his hand up with so much garbage in the end. So not, oh, yeah. the, not, the, pot, not the push that he needed from the Yogg there at all. Uh, okay, we just heard the secrets are Eye for Eye and Repentance. Mm. So let's see what we do about this. Eye for Eye, probably not that especially powerful. Repentance might do something depending on the situation. Yeah, I mean, Disciple of Cthulhu is obviously the, the best minion for Ecop to proc with that. It'll be a little bit painful on an Acolyte. It'll be hugely painful on a, on a Cthulhu or an uh, Ancient Shieldbearer, for example. But, I mean, I, even like the Acolyte getting here, he still cycles in one card. It, it's really going to be down to Ecop, like how much he wants to play around this eventuality here, right? Like how much does he really care if the Acolyte only cycles one card at this point? Because he's cycled so heavily already, right? Yep. Like he's, he's, mm -hmm. he should be confident at this point that he's going to draw his deck this yeah, game, right? definitely. So. And it's also not that the Acolyte of Pain won't draw at least one card exactly, in this way. Right. So yeah, perfectly fine. So yeah, there, there goes the Repentance, just the uh, the eye for an eye left, and yeah, Ecop is just going to cycle this Battle Rage for one. Again, again, just pretty confident he's going to draw his deck this game, doesn't want to risk you know having to Battle Rage in a position where there's too many injured minions and, and draw his deck, for example. Sometimes people like to, to keep the Battle Rage until after they've made the Brand Doom Caller play, yep. so they can draw mm -hmm. both Cthulhu's in one turn, just have them guaranteed, but that doesn't make a huge impact on the game usually, because right. you, you have to play them out over the course of two turns mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so normally you can just wait and draw your deck naturally afterwards. Yeah, I also agree there. Um, did you like not um, playing the Shield Bearer here? Because you could have also played the Shield Bearer. Staying mana effective, gaining these 10 armor. That's true, actually. Yeah, I 
So he chose to, what, cast Battle Rage, Armor Up, and Float 2 mana instead of just playing the Shield Bearer. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, it seems odd now that you look at it. Definitely does seem bizarre. And the Shield Bearer is active, as you can see there. has the yellow border, so... Yeah, strange decision, actually. I think, yeah, after the Repentance is proc'd, I guess just playing for some tempo, gaining the armor, is probably just a bit stronger. Yeah, definitely. I mean, staying mana effective, also staying mana effective with a discounted cartoon cut seems to be very reasonable. Seizing the board, everything good, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, but... Getting Ikob, a better battle rage, too. Ikob gonna go ahead and shield block here. Like, I don't believe, like, he has shield slam in his deck, for example. Sometimes his deck plays one shield slam. Sometimes mm -hmm. he just sneaks in there as a one-off. I'm not sure if Ecop is playing that list, but maybe that was his consideration, right? That, like, um, Ancient Shield Bearer would always give him an answer to Malagos, for example. Okay. Like, you know, shield bearer, armor up, and shield slam. But having said that, I really don't think he's playing that list with the one shield slam. So, uh, yeah, I just, I just like playing the 6-6 six -six that turn. I think you're yeah. totally right. Yeah, also considering that he got access to double execute yep. with the proc, and yeah. Um, I also guess the uh, one shield slam would have made him play the shield bearer, right? So only if he plays double shield slam in his deck, he would ever keep sure. it back. Yeah, I think you're right. So Ica comes down, taking care of the Drake. Looks like he was whether he, considering whether to uh, Ica his own Acolyte in that situation, but... Uh, it's the Druid that's having fatigue issues here, and now with uh, Malagos Moonfire, uh, Living Roots, Living Roots. That's 15 damage of Malagos spells, plus uh, 5 damage naturally from the cards, so that's 20 total. Which so is, is just pretty a little close, bit close, which yeah. is pretty damn close. It is. It's nearly there. I mean, if he'd have had a, a little bit more discount and able to like fit in a Feral Rage somewhere, then he'd uh, he'd be pushing himself over the line. But even if he does make the push here, we can see that Ecop has the uh, the Shield Bearer to rebound. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Very how does Sixo do this? Like he's. He's either going to have to rely on his Malagos to stick at some point, which, based on the amount of removal he's seen, he knows isn't going to happen, right? Yeah, he hasn't, seen, it, hasn't seen a single execute, so that, like, that world's just gone, right? Yeah, like, Malagos absolutely. is never sticking. Mm -hmm. So, in that case, how else can he make a board state that conceivably pushes through some damage so that Malagos is able to finish the game? Yeah, I also was just wondering about the last card in Sixth deck because uh, we saw him going down to one card, so uh, I'm really curious. Did you, take, uh, did you keep track? Uh, I honestly have no idea what the last card is. Uh, we've seen both. Uh, we've seen both. We've seen one natural wild growth at least that got duplicated with the thistle tea, as you can right. see. Mm -hmm. uh, was one wild growth played as well? Because there was a, the one that was taken off Raven Idol, for example. So. Okay, but he has double wild growth in the hand. So. Right, but that's from thistle tea. Oh, okay, uh, right, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I also have no idea. It could, be, it could be Wild Growth, but I'm honestly just guessing. Okay, um, I guess one reason to keep the Shield Bearer in the hand, or probably maybe the only reason to keep the Shield Bearer in the hand, might have been that he really wants to go for this Bran into Shield Bearer turn. So I would really be surprised not seeing the Bran into Shield Bearer here. I, I mean, I, honestly, I had the feeling that he was on the, the, the Bran Doomcaller plan from the beginning of the game, so... Um, I'm not sure. We'll see. Like, I mean, either way is a win condition, right? When you're playing against Malagos specifically, you know that you know this deck plays enough answers to stop them on board, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. if you can just simply gain enough life, then you can probably see that as a win condition a lot of the time. Okay, that's true. Um, I'm just curious about Ekop uh, not dying here because you already pointed out that um, Sixo has access to 20 damage from the hand. Yep. So that's pretty. I mean, it's pretty close. It really is, yeah. I mean, he could he could play Cthulhu here safely if he wants to like rush on with the um, with the the, the Doomcaller plan because even if it didn't clear the board, he has zero mana execute to yep. be able to follow it up. Yeah. Uh, so he could have safely played Cthulhu there if he's keeping track of the potential damage. Yep. Um, and he would have like got a hundred percent got away with it, but he is now finally deciding to bring out that shield bearer just to make that push on board. And it's I'll call it a second auction. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's a yeah, second auction. auction yeah. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess it's simply over now. I guess, yeah. There's really nothing at all Xixo might be uh, do here. Really nothing. Nope. Uh, no, like there's just no way you expect Wisps to stick to the board. If you drop Malagos, then you know there's still executes in the deck, and Ekop has most of his deck in his hand. Yeah. So you're you're likely to see the second execute there. But I think your only actual potential win condition is to just go in with Malagos, right, and just hope yeah. that hope that execute and Cthulhu <laughs> are the bottom two cards. Right? Yeah, they, I they, guess they so. just have to be. Yeah, As, I agree. It's the only win condition, I think. I agree. I just, like, how does this ever win the game? Ever. Honestly, I'm just, I don't see it. No, I also don't see it. <laughs>
But either way, uh, I think what we can see whatever decision Sixo made, he was going to end up losing the game. So, uh, you know, Ecop can just pick his poison here. I'm sure he'll just end up slamming Cthulhu. Uh, almost yep. guaranteed to be able to clear the board alongside the 6-6 the six, six attack and the weapon attack. And then, as you said, if one Cthulhu can be dealt with, then he's not going to deal with Cthulhu number two and number three, and the game is just going to end very, very quickly because Sixo just has no viable win conditions left. Exactly. So, a very good win for Ekop here. And yeah, I mean, Khatun Boria, um, definitely important um, that he stayed so that he can utilize it for the other games for sure, because that was, I think, that was a very, very important game here. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's it's. Uh since the one of the cuts that Cthulhu, that the cycle Cthulhu makes to make room for all the cycle package, mm -hmm. they usually go down to one shield bearer, right? So their ability to pick themselves up outside of the, the Malagos damage isn't always there. So mm -hmm. it's a matchup where if Druid was able to get through some mid-game pressure, yep. then I can definitely see the Malagos Druid being better against that style of warrior than say like a pure control warrior, for example, mm -hmm. who can just gain masses and masses of life with Justicar. So I think that was a winnable game from 6-0 and an important win for, to pick up for, for Ecom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it looks like they are just getting ready to queue into uh, game two now. I've never seen 6-0 eat so much on camera as he has at this tournament. It looks like he's been taking Stan Sifka lessons. He's been munching on bananas. Yeah, bananas. I also saw them. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to me as a side note. But it's going to be Cycle Cthulhu again from Ecop. No great surprise. And 6-0 queuing up his uh, Anything, uh, pa Anything Murloc Paladin. Mm -hmm. The matchup probably being very, I mean, kind of favorable for the Paladin because uh, both decks, again, answer the early game uh, threats. Usually Warrior, of course, in a way better way than the Paladin. But to make up for that, the Paladin has uh, access to the very, very insanely strong nuts uh, late game. And I would not be surprised to 6 6 winning this one. What do you think, Sokol? Yeah, again, I think a big deal is uh, the the lack of armor gain in the Cthulhu Warrior, right? There's no Justicar, there's usually only one Shield Bearer. We haven't seen Ecop's list in full detail, but I'm, I'm pretty confident he's only running one. So, when, or like originally, once Murkai went out the format, pure Cthulhu Warrior with Justicar and two Shield Bearers could just get out of range of the second anything, right? Oh, it's like, okay. it's like, yeah, you can't kill me. Your second anything do does 30 or 32 damage, depending on which arrangement that you okay. pick up. Mm -hmm. And I can just get outside of that. But Cthulhu Warrior, uh, Cycle Cthulhu, because they cut some of the armor gain back, they actually don't really have that ability. So they've actually got to try and race to a win mm -hmm. condition themselves. And that gives the, the anything Paladin a, a big edge as well. But the, the new addition of Ivory Knight, of course, can change that dynamic completely, because you have a, an 11% chance to just pick up a third anything <laughs> which they right. are definitely not surviving. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. So um, we see uh, Xixo already having all these Murlocs in his hand. Um, do you think it's rather an advantage or a disadvantage to have all the Murlocs from the beginning of your game? I think it's very matchup dependent. I think if you had the Murlocs in your opening hand, you can actually match some quicker decks for tempo a lot of the time, and yeah. like, that's, that's very effective for you. But in a matchup that's like not all that tempo focused, I don't know how much of a big deal it is, but I think specifically in this matchup, I think the two decks are just kind of racing to their win conditions, right? Okay. So okay. The, the quicker that 6-0 can get there, you know, if he's able to cast anything number one on turn mm -hmm. 10 because he's already played all his Murlocs, mm -hmm. I think that's what he will want to be doing. Okay, yeah, I agree there. Mm, so what do we see? Ekop? Okay, Ekop obviously wants, just wants to cycle as fast as possible. Yeah, the, the sooner the better. So what can we say about it? We can already see one Acolyte being able to cycle one additional card, so that was definitely not that bad. Commanding shoutouts in the hand. Battle Rage missing. Yeah, Battle Rage definitely a big pickup that he's going to need, but 6 -0 straight away, putting these Murlocs that we discussed to very, very good use, getting a value trade with the buffed uh, Blue Gill Warrior, taking out the Acolyte of Pain, making sure there's no additional cycle available. Right, Battle Rage would be so incredibly important in this very situation, because if we'll be able to clear the Murloc, um, the Super Battle Murloc, with his Fiery Vorex, for 3 damage, um, but uh, by doing so, reducing the, um, the Blue Gill so that he can trade into it, yeah, really, um, he should really fish for this battle rage. Yep, so he's going to do it. Slam number one goes down. Slam number two does not have any targets unless he wants to slam his own one. Three, so he's actually just going to cycle the shout here, it looks like. How do you feel about this? Um, it's definitely very interesting. Um, 
I think it's okay. He's, uh, he preserves the weapon charge, and both of his minions, um, oh, no, one one of his minions would die otherwise. So you gain some value out of it. And I think the importance of just cycling to this battle range is so important that you should just um, play all your cycle cards as soon as possible. Also, in this in this matchup specifically, how often are you going to need to pyro commanding shout as a board clear? Right, yeah. like yeah. the only situation is like uh, the the first anything happens and you need to clear mm -hmm. that initial wave of murlocs, but. Probably if you've let the Paladin get to the point where they can securely play, start playing their anything, yep. you're probably on the downward spiral to losing the game. Oh yeah, right. definitely. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. Just digging for the Battle Rage seems to be like a very big deal here. And you see Sixo has now picked up anything number one and does have Murloc number three out of four in his hand. So he is moving towards, as he said, that, that win condition very, very quickly. Looks like he may very possibly be able to start going off on turn 10. Mm -hmm. Also, that being said, we also have to say that Tyrion is also just an uh, uber bomb in this very matchup. Oh, so, yeah. if you can just play Tyrion in turn 8 and then this being followed by a turn 10 anything, that is just insane. Yeah, I definitely agree. And it looks like Ecop this time is considering the, the Tempo Emperor. I think he, he realizes that this matchup is progressing a little bit quicker than he yep. would have liked. You know, so many Murlocs have come down already that he's looking to speed up in response to this as well. It's not only this, but uh, I think the Emperor is really just forcing out this power equality. Sure. I mean, I'm probably since he won't play that, but the only real clean answer to Thorison, I mean, I don't even know. I think there are not even clean answers to Thorison, so I would definitely go for Emperor here. Um, uh, Ecop disagrees. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Again, I mean, it does look like Ecop is, is dedicated to making sure he can always hit that brand Doomcaller combo. It's like. Yeah, we, we, we had this same discrepancy in the Druid game where we both said, you know, Tempo Emperor on the board against Druid just seems really solid, but he is uh, fixated on the idea of this deck as a combo deck and is going to continue to go with that strategy, but Cyber of Cthulhu just being generated to face here, but yeah, I mean, what, what answers are there, honestly, because like Bluegill True Silver is a possible answer, right? But both Bluegills have already yeah, been played, so yeah, like, I really how, do you it. how do you remove five damage from an empty board as Paladin without using an equality, which is just such a huge reason source for them in the matchup. Yeah, I can also really not see it. I mean, either you have the Sorison who provides you two to three ticks, and uh, while doing so delivers five to ten damage into the face of the Paladin, or well, the worst case would be that a Pyromancer equality becomes played, and that's actually a very good case. So yep. um, I don't even know about this uh, discounting combo, what he aims for. I mean, what, what would be... Okay, I mean, now he comes down, but yeah. I'm really not sure about that. <laughs> I mean, this is interesting. Cause if he plays it now, he's he's you know he's played additional additional minions first. So if anything, you're making your opponent happier about have, bit, yeah. having to, to pyromancer equality, right? Because you've you've generated this additional minion on the board. Yeah, I'm also curious. I mean, what would you like, or how would you like, uh, possibly like to discount in order to make it very very valuable? That's true. Yeah, I mean, with the Doomcaller in hand already, he can already brand Doomcaller, right? So what else could he possibly be looking for? Yeah, exactly. So... Yeah, I guess it's true. I don't know, strange decision from Ecop, just, you know, refusing to uh, to drop the Emperor here, and 6-0 gets a free turn of tempo with the Doomsayer. Now, this, just, this is just purely about setting up empty board Tyrion, right? So... He's saying to e like Ecop can probably smell what this play means, right? Yeah. With like Doomsayer being played. So, you know, he's gonna have to decide whether he wants to commit resources into killing a Doomsayer just to stop the empty board Tyrion coming down. But I guess it could be Tyrion. It, um, I don't know whether Light Lord is being played. Mm. Um, there might be Light Lord. I think there might we, be yeah, I think Rag Light Lord wasn't. I think we've seen it in his list from mm. previous games, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's either one of those. Sure. Yeah, sure. yeah, good point. I mean, now he just passes, sure. He just armors up and passes. I would have thought so. I mean, he does... <sighs> I mean, you never shield slam that thing, right? No, no, I mean, wh why should you? Yeah. I mean, you don't shield slam Ecolite here, right? You yeah. just pass, it dies. I mean, Ecop refused to play the Sorison when there was no Doomsayer, so uh, <laughs> he definitely won't play the um, resources to kill the Doomsayer just to play what he played the last turn anyways. Sure. Yeah, so he's just going to cycle out this Battle Rage for one card here, push it ah, a okay. little bit, picks up the Beckoner of Evil, and it's gets a little more Cthulhu buffing ability, and yeah, this is going to be a, a snap Tyrion hit from... Oh, although the, the Song Vigil is tempting, but this whole play was to set up Tyrion Forge Ring specifically, so you might as well just jam it on the board. OK. 
okay. So now this Tyrion, of course, insanely threatening. Um, yeah, cannot even. I mean, he can um, deplete the Divine Shield with the Blood to Iker. So, uh, oh, I heard this Blood to Iker, right? If you, that, uh, that's the Greek pronunciation. Uh, but uh, yeah, he can deplete it, and he can then also shield in the Tyrion. But the five-three weapon is still there, delivering 15 damage. It's a huge deal. Yeah, and that 15 damage is, is a huge deal in this matchup specifically, because as we talked about at the start, there is potential for just Warrior to gain up so much life that they just outvalue the Anythings if they're able to clear them off the board after they're played. Right. And they only get in that, that one initial burst. So the fact you have that 15 damage from the Tyrion weapon to go along with all that can make a huge difference. As mm -hmm. well. It definitely will. Yeah, and um, yeah, a lot to yeah. Iker have been playing on the Tyrion, shields them, and hmm, what else? Well, probably back on Earth and Ecolite, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I see no reason not to not to develop here. You're not committing any huge resources to board, so even though it looks like a huge board, if this is the kind of board that takes an equality away from your opponent, you're not too sad about mm -hmm. that, right? Because it's, it's not a huge resource that you're dropping down. The Acolyte potentially replaces itself as well, but again, Ecot very much slow playing his hand here, definitely playing... Uh, with a lot less initiative on the board than we're suggesting. Um, what do you think why he didn't want to play the Ecolite? Do you think he waits uh, for potential that he can play Ecolite into Slam or a potential Ghoul? Uh, it, it's possible. I mean, he he might be considering that he wants to press the, the Hero Power button every turn as well at this point, but I think that's just a futile gesture at this point. I don't think he's ever going to... Like, he hasn't got off to a good enough start with Armor game yep. to actually like get out range towards the end, so... I can only imagine that you're right, and he's just waiting till he can get some immediate value out of that oh, Acolyte, wow. because his hand does not have cycle tools, but there is the final Murloc, and both Anythings are now in hand in the perfect timing, because next turn is turn 10. Sixo can use the first Anything can happen to clear out these Twin Emperors, and then the second one can potentially push through for the damage. It's just completely crazy. He just threw the fourth Murloc, both anything, basically exactly what you said, perfect timing by turn 10. His hand not even be that big, but if you got all your combo pieces with all the Murlocs, well, that's a pretty good spot to be in. Right, it's like some, some games with, with Miracle Rogue, for example, like back in the day, they just used to draw like Leroy, Cold Blood, Cold Blood, Shadow Step, Eviscerate, and you just die, right? Like yeah. they'd skip the part of the game where they draw their whole deck with Auctioneer because they just yeah. drew 30 damage and killed you. And that's pretty much what's happened here. Sixo hasn't had to cycle his whole deck to get this job done. This is going to be anything number one, which coincidentally generates two six, six damage threes. charging wow. Murlocs to take out two six damage taunts. And now next turn, even if these five fours are cleared, there are two possible outcomes from anything number two. One does 30 damage, one does 32 damage. So the game is over. Yeah, Echo definitely won't be happy about this because at the moment he still has big hopes that this second anything doesn't see play. But no, no, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah, he's going to get some bad news. And that is that Sixo has pulled together his entire combo in the top part of his deck. There you go. Four eight damages going in the 32 damage combination. And that is Sixo tying up the series at one game apiece. Yeah, pretty silly. But yeah, I mean, basically what we said beforehand, the Murloc um, once in the very late game or in the normal late game will usually be able to outvalue the Cartoon Warrior yeah. or at least uh, crush him with the amount of uh, cards he got. Yeah, and the, the defensive options just aren't there anymore. You know, they. Control Warrior back in the day, A, used to be able to gain so much more life, B, they also had access to Sludge Belcher, which mm -hmm. made the Murlocs trade into it so yep. inefficiently, right? So the second anything would have like, you know, some 10 damage charging Bluegill Warriors, and you'd have to send mm -hmm. two of them into a Sludge Belcher yep. to get through it. But those options just aren't available anymore. Warrior just doesn't really have the tools to outlast that deck, unless they're playing the super greedy Justicar, two Ancient Shield Bearers, you know, get themselves up to like 70 life and, and get out of range of the second anything in that way. Rip Sludge Belcher. Rip Sludge Belcher indeed. God rest his soul. And Zoo is going to come out here as the response to the, the Anythin Paladin. How do you feel about this as a, as a matchup, Zoo, against the, the Control Paladin variants? No, I guess Zoo is fine. I mean, um, Anythin Paladin is kind of very weak in the early game. Has 
potential, but um, if um, anything doesn't draw exactly the right card, sometimes they just skip the first, entirely the first three turns, and this is definitely something you can just not do again. So yeah, and Sixo here has got a rough decision on his hand, in my opinion. You can kind of see it etched on his face, where yeah, he has to decide if loot hoard or true silver is good enough, or whether he wants to look for like real power cards like Doomsayer that can lock out the early game turns. Well, loot hoard is perfectly fine for turn two. It's probably one of the best things you might do, and true silver is just amazing at turn four. Yeah. Basically, stabilizes you into turn six, where you can even if you didn't draw your equality, you can play stuff like pyromancer and the consecration and stuff like this. Sure. And the fact that Ecop is leading with Flame Imp here is just going to mean the perfect interaction yep. for the Loot Hoarder. You know, Voidwalker, Possessed Villager, that Argent Squire would have had a much better time against the Loot Hoarder, but Mortal Ecop coil. is going to lose its 3 2. Yeah, unless there is a Mortal Coil, Elven and Archer, or something. No. Yeah, no such thing, unfortunately. That is three very premium one drops for the deck. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you really, I, I would really not know what to pick, but I get just a flaming because the damage on your hero is simply irrelevant at this very point. So yeah, just pick this, go for yeah, it. Yeah, I think so too. I think, I think one, one of the problems with New Zoo having lost um, you know, a bunch of the death rails and stuff is actually a lot of the minions are just kind of wimpy. Like some yep. of the time, it's, it's hard to like push damage through to heavy control decks a lot yep. of the time when mm -hmm. you, you just have like villagers and two twos and argent squires. Mm -hmm. Like it's basically just like control decks. Like say I'm going to kill your doom guards and then I'm going to kill the three drops in your deck and yep. then you just can't kill me. Like mm -hmm. you just don't have the power left anymore. So making sure you have the big like powerful one drops like flame imp against the control decks can actually be a really big deal. Oh yeah. I think it's also of utmost important that Zeus stays mana effective during the first three turns of this game. Turn four might not be that important because you already established some kind of board there, but the first three turns are of utmost importance. Yeah, sure. So True Silver, you said, could be a big deal, but that Councilman coming down perfectly on curve means that True Silver is not going to be able to address it with zero board presence to back it up. But mm -hmm. what other option does he really have? He has to go for the True Silver. It's the only thing to start fighting back. But it means now for Ecop that that Councilman is going to start pushing through a lot of damage. Yeah, and this is a True Silver attack on this 3-2 was also not especially appealing. So yeah, definitely tapping here and just playing these two minions. In this case, these two minions. <laughs> Um, so yeah, a lot of damage, everything good. Yeah, yeah but again, you can, you can kind of see the point, right, of how important that Councilman is right now, because without that, he just doesn't really have that much power on the board, right? right. So he needs to really make sure he pushes through initiative with that Councilman, and 6-0, no source of additional clearing in hand. A Consecrate here would help him be able to take out the Councilman. A Bluegill Warrior yep. would do the same thing, but just no source of additional damage right now. Yeah, and also reducing the Councilman to one attack doesn't really help. Right. Yeah, so he just grows again, and uh, he has a lot of heal. If you say that the Doomsayer is also kind of a 7 heal, he has access to so much heal, but it's just not good enough if Zoo can simply draw cuts and refill the board and deliver the same amount of damage every turn again and again. Yes, it's similar to the Reno Lock matchup, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it's all well and good, you jam Reno, you go back to full health, but yep. if the Zoo still has 4 or 5 minions on the board, you're mm -hmm. gonna lose that 30 very, very quickly. Exactly, yeah. It doesn't help if you heal for 12, if you lose 14 life in the next turn. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think this is just desperation time from Sixo, where he realizes he needs to cycle cards. He doesn't have the tools he needs in hand right now. Plays out Doomsayer, as you said, just to slow his opponent down, so he has to trade into it to keep his board. In yep. the meantime, he's going to cycle one more card off that Acolyte, try and pick up a Consecration, try and pick up a Pyromancer, a, a Bluegill Warrior even, just something to get rid of that Councilman that's just going to kill him at this point. I mean, it's so insane. Not only does Sixo uh, uh, not have the equality in his hand as one piece of his combo, but he also just doesn't uh, have a Consecration nor a Pyromancer in his hand. Yep. So he's really missing the entire um, uh, entire palette, uh, the entirety of his combo. So he cannot even top deck anything here. I absolutely love this from Ecop. He's in fact actually just got lethal. The power overwhelming See. pushing through. I didn't turn even five. see this. Turn five. Yeah, turn so five. I didn't have time to count the extra damage going on to the uh, the, the Darkshire Councilman, but playing all the minions out and Abusive Sergeant and Power Overwhelming, that is actually just a super early lethal for Ecop, and the Doomsayer did nothing in the end. Yeah, absolutely insane. Turn 5 lethal from the zoo. Um, what did you say about missing damage? 
Yeah, uh, exactly. No, exactly. But that's what I said. Like the important minions are the three drops a lot of the time, right? They're the things that can really push yep. through damage. Yep. And there was just no answer to that councilman and Zoo getting the job done as Zoo always does. I think Zoo has been very successful in this tournament for Ecop. I think like a lot of people have started to think that Zoo is dropping off a little bit yep. in power level, uh, but Ecop has had great success with it so far. And now he is going to run it into the Shaman from Six O. I'm actually a little bit surprised because Shaman tended to be very unfavorable against Zoo, but um, we also know that Sixo runs these two Maelstrom portals. What do you think um, will ha these Maelstrom portals have for an effect? How much does it do? So I was just having this discussion uh, in the in the player area before I came up here with a, a couple of the UK players, and they insist that Agro Shaman, if you run double portal, one Lightning Storm, is now favored in this matchup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, the Maelstrom Portal is just such an insane card, you know, not only because of the obvious interaction with Forbidden Ritual, which is mm -hmm. insane, right? But yep. just yep. for breaking ties between, you know, you play Argent Squire, they play a 2-2, for example, mm -hmm. right? They play a Flame Imp. Yep. Um, the, the Maelstrom Portal just breaks that tie perfectly on curve. Even this tie that you see here between two Argent Squires or an Argent Squire and a Tunnel Trog, for example, can be done perfectly with the Maelstrom Portal on curve. So it's such a hugely flexible tool in so many different situations for the Shaman deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. The Maelstrom Portal is just an insane nuts card against uh, Zoo. Did you do uh, a card review for this set? Did you, did you stream? Yes, the card did, I did. What did you think of Maelstrom Portal, like, sight unseen? Very, very strong. Really? Yeah. Okay, so because I'm not afraid to admit that I didn't think the card was going to be that powerful. And, oh, okay. and when I actually got to play with it, just straight away, I was like, wow, this is nuts. <laughs> like, I had no idea it was going to be this strong. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Um, I think one point which might look um, a little bit uh, weak in this card is that the one drops are not equal to the other um, X drops of the game. So if a card reads it's an average uh, five drop, that's usually weaker than five five. If it, a card reads it's a six drop, it's usually weaker than six six. Yes. Way weaker, way weaker. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. But a one drop is not weaker than one one. A one drop is way way stronger than a one one yeah. in average. So yeah, that yeah. almost at worst it's a one yeah. one, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah man, no, that makes sense. It's a good point. Um, but your dot peddler going to come out to make sure he can fill out his curve here as Ecop. But already you see the impact of that first Maelstrom portal and. Sixo just has a second one to back it up at some point as well. Feral Spirit's really strong early game card to have in this matchup as well. Just oh, to yeah. generate the individual bodies to fight back against the multiple bodies that Zoo have. That's mm -hmm. what you want, right? You want to be able to break up your attacks in a variety of different ways a lot of the time. I mean, here you just take the Soul Fire, right? It's just by far the, well, the strongest card. I are you, are you not a Shift to Zerus dreamer, life coach? <laughs> yeah, sure, the dreams. But yeah, I guess Soul Fire is also Yeah, Soul Fire good. has to be the thing. Unfortunate is the not does not let him answer the uh, the tunnel trog this turn unless he wants to soul fire it directly like the the he just that one damage off being able to soul fire the shield bearer and take care of the tunnel trog in that fashion but I mean do, do you cast it here or are you going to hold on to it and try and uh, find a better target for it later on No you hold on to it and try to find a better target uh, later on also um, you might have the ability to play it after your hand is empty though this won't happen very, very often Again, Ecop disagrees. He's going to go for the Soul Fire. I think, like, I, I don't necessarily disagree. I definitely would have roped on this decision myself, yeah, I yeah. think, like, because the fight for early board control in this matchup is so defining, right? And I think yeah. that was the conversation we were having is like, it's, it's now kind of favored for Shaman because, sure, the game's defined by early board control. But if Shaman falls behind, they actually have comeback, right? Yep. They have the Maelstrom Pool, they have the Lightning Storm. If Zoo falls behind, it's over. They just yep. can't climb yep. back onto the board. Mm -hmm. So I can understand from Ecop's position not wanting to fall behind it this early in the game and therefore using the Soul Fire to make sure that the early game exchange was relatively 50-50. Yeah, I think it's ultra close. I think both players uh, are... I, I would also not know which one. I think I would have kept the Soul Fire, but I think the other player is at, at least as, as strong as that player. So, sure. yeah. It just, I think it depends hugely heavily on the hands of both players. Fair enough. So Knife Juggler probably going to get some work done here. Three minions on the board that can go down. And Ecop is actually going to take a slight risk here, which is reduce the amount of minion targets just to increase the value of his Defender of Argus on the board, right? Because if the knife had hit the shield Oh, wow, bearer, this is so important. Then the Defender of Argus has to trade into the 2-1 and just you know, doesn't get a value trade and dies. But that there is the risk of that play where you increase the chances of the knife going face from 25 to 33%. That was just so unlucky and so important. This one knife juggle hit. I mean, 
we didn't even comment on this fiery bat coming out of this maelstrom oh, portal. Yeah, yeah. But this fiery bat out of this maelstrom portal, in combination with the knife cycler hitting the face, is just so insanely unlucky, especially in a matchup where a tempo is everything. Mm -hmm. Rock Biter weapon coming out here, taking care of the knife juggler, so he did not get the work done that Ecop would have wanted him to. Fiery Bat doesn't take care of the, the first half, at least, of the Possessed Villager. That does go face as well, so at least a tiny bit of justice for Ecop there, but that knife juggler is huge, and with the knife juggler just used, he picks up the Forbidden Ritual as well. Oh, what could have been? I think we have some spectator issues here. It seems like Ecop just brings out the spectator issues with him. Oh, Hopefully I see we some can get this uh, cleared up very quickly. I see some Doom Emma coming down, being at one mana for the Shaman at the moment. Ah. And Doom Emma is exactly what Sixto needed to deliver this face damage. Very, very important. Yeah, so if he played a Doom Hammer here, that is 5, 9. The Trog gets buffed to 12. That's another 4 damage. 16 damage pushed through potentially that turn from uh, Sixo if he did decide to go completely aggressive. But hopefully we can uh, get reconnected to this game in spectator mode as quickly as possible. Um, we are just missing the crucial closing stages of this fourth game, but it looks like Sixo is in a very, very dominant position if he did, in fact, draw Doomhammer that turn. And yes, indeed, he did. Yeah, we could have also just kept a look at the face cam on Ekop and uh, evaluate the bot set from there. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. It's like, yeah, how salty is Ekop <laughs> looking at the proceedings of this game? Uh, I would say very salty. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he is going to push damage face by the looks of things. Everything going through. Trog going through. Is the Flame Tongue going to pick up a value trade? Yes, it is. And then he is going to choose to trade out some minions as well here. Oh, very interesting. I would have probably preferred go just going face. What do you think about that? Um, again, I mean, it, it just in this point at this point, you know, how does Ecop actually climb back into the game, right? If it, it's four minions against two, those two one ones don't do nearly enough to contest the board. So, you know, I, I said a minute ago, you know, Shaman is the the class in this matchup that has the chance to come back from behind. Mm -hmm. So, if Sixo is already representing lethal with this push the way he did it, and he's cementing the fact that he's ahead on board. Yep. He creates kind of like a 100% scenario, right? Like what possibly could happen to bring Ecop back from this position? Yeah, I'm just thinking that if you don't uh, clear these minions, um, your um, I mean, plant tank is obviously healthier. But I'm also thinking that if you bring down the zoo to five life, it's not only that you're shutting down the board, but you also shut down the ability for zoo to draw uh, additional cards. And then you got one totem and a card every turn against one crappy card. So I can really not see any scenario how zoo might climb back if you if you just target the life total. Sure. I mean, I think, like, bottom line moral of this story is, you know, pick a line and you're probably going to win anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. in this situation, different players will come up with different scenarios. Like, yeah. what you will usually do in your mind at this point is, like, say, okay, how do I lose? And mm -hmm. then, honestly, like, the first world that occurs to you where you lose, that's what you end yeah. up playing around, right? And exactly. often, often that's very different to different people. But mm -hmm. either way, 6-0 does, in, in the end, find the necessary damage that he needs, pushes through the Doomhammer, this grand final is going all the way to game five. And this is exactly what we expected from two of the best players in the world. Um, the finals, grand finals, obviously not very quick, not 3 0 Both players being a 2-2 to deliver a very, very great final here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a final that's lived up to how these two have played, honestly. I think... I, I've said before, I think Ecop has had the most consistent play throughout the tournament. Mm -hmm. I think mean, he wouldn't necessarily be regarded going into this tournament as one of the strongest players in it, but I think his play has bore out that he is one of the strongest players in this tournament. Everyone else has had some slightly shaky moments, apart from perhaps Sixo, who's the other guy that we found in grand finals. Right. So, mm -hmm. You know, some of the players who've had inconsistent play throughout have got found out and haven't made it this far. Sixo and Ecop have got rewarded for their consistency, and honestly, I think Chucky was probably the other player that you could throw in there. Even Oskaka has made some weird mistakes in this tournament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these two have been rewarded for their consistent play throughout. And now this game is for all the marbles. It's Druid against Shaman. And this is the time, everything on the line, that Ecop will have been begging to draw and innovate. And he got one. Yeah, which is perfectly, uh, uh, absolutely perfect. Um, but we also already, uh, also the rules. I mean, the rules being an incredibly yes. strong card against Shaman. Um, the best way for Shaman to counter these two one ones is exactly what you see on the bot, Surf and Lemurgerton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Finley, uh, Argent Squire, Possessed Villager can all do kind of reasonably, but Ecop here does have the uh, the Wrath 
to back it up, but he's just going to choose to hero power here. What do you think about this? Well, I guess the Ross might find better targets. The Tusk got to Tamek, maybe, but also uh, maybe a Trox. So keeping on the Ross, I don't mind it too much. It's okay. My question here is what happens if Mama your opponent plays... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very <laughs> possible. What happens if your opponent plays, plays Totem Golem? I, I guess if you Wrath on the 1-3, then you would only have three damage in play for the Totem Golem right. anyway, so like it doesn't really make that much difference. But yeah, luckily for Ecop, no uh, oh, huge swingy outcome from the Tuscar Totemi. He has picked up the Nourish oh, with the so Ancient good. of War already in hand. You just, this is, is this Snap Mana here? On yeah, the, Snap on Mana. The, on, the, on the Nourish, yeah. I, I like to see it. It's just so insanely strong. I mean, if you lose against a Fae Shaman, the way to lose it is because you are behind in tempo. Yep. And suddenly you just, and you're just two turns ahead in Mana Tempo, clearing the, oh, oh that's Hero Power! What? Hero Power instead of Wrath! Why? What? what is he saving this Wrath for? That's two Wrath targets now that he's turned down. I have no idea, but it definitely creates five more damage into his face, so I'm also not exactly sure what he planned with this play. I mean, he now has a Wrath for the Flame Tongue Totem. Yeah. <laughs> is that much? It's not too bad, yeah, sure. That is a strange decision. I mean, sure, I mean, the Wrath on the 1-3, we could, you know, sit and have a debate about, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, like, absolutely. it's a low-value target, but, you know, the upside was that it was on curve, it was turn yeah. 2, it was perfect mana usage. Wrathing a 3-2 there just seemed like a no-brainer, and Ecop just turned it down, but picks up the power of the world to honestly give himself a very strong turn this turn. Wrath's the, ancient, Wrath's the uh, Flame Tongue Tome, mm -hmm. Hero powers down the 1-2, that he, uh, the 0-1 that he Hero powered down last time, contests the 3-2 with his own 3-2, yep. and now we've reached the point where 5-10s uh, and 8-8s are hitting the board, so his whoa, plan whoa. has worked out okay for him, and that is a Pretty massive, massive. Draw. Nice. Wow. This is crazy, and you just play it, right? You just play it. Here. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you, you absolutely mulch this. Next turn, the, the Shaman will not be able to generate a board yeah. that big. So yeah. next turn, your Ancient of War or your Giant, whatever option you want to go for, has a much better chance of sticking. <laughs> <laughs> that is a choke, yeah. although this game is going off. Yeah, absolutely, especially with his hero power, right? I mean, he can just reveal a lot of cards and then show guy, bam, in your <laughs> face. <laughs> Okay, he just... Oh, 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 okay, that's interesting. So he opts in to play Archangel and Shapeshift over in the War. Yes, yep. I think this is absolutely right. There's, yep. no, there's yep. no need to be defensive right yep. now, right? Like, you get to clear the board. There was no initiative from the Shaman that turn, so yeah. this is your chance to be aggressive yourself. Yeah, I really like it, especially because... Um, six oh! Yeah, oh, wow. oh! That Doomhammer Let's go. changes everything. <laughs> um, yeah. Hmm. That's 10 damage right now. It's 10 more damage next turn, plus two oh, lightning Oh, wow. Bolts. All right, okay. But little does he Ooh. know, little does he know. Look at this, wow. And I mean, because he played the giant TM, um, Sixo might even have a very, very hard time to rock by during this Ancient of War. I mean, he, he will need to do that, but it comes with a big cost here. I mean, if he rock by as the Ancient of War, then he has to play the Torn, or else it's just lethal on board oh, with the Giant. Oh, this is so expensive. Crazy. Barrel Rage Hero Power here offensively now from Ecop. This is so insane. This is over. Ten it's over. It's over. Race. Ten damage. Barrel Rage and bam. Ecop. Not Ecop. Already. No, Ecop not only BM. has Yogg. No, 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 no. Oh, 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 don't do it. Is no. Ecop please? Oh. <laughs> no. Oh okay, my he didn't God. Do it. He didn't do it. What a troll, <laughs> Ecop. You nearly yeah. got me. Ecop has yeah. won a major, ladies no, and gentlemen. Oh, That is sick. That is as sick as it might have become. Wow, holy crap, that is some serious dedication to trolling. Biggest moment of his career, major on the line, he still had that moment to <laughs> troll the audience. Tempting fate with the Yog. That is yours, Ecop! That is yours, you've earned it. That's seriously sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it all turned down in the last turn three uh, turns of the game. So, such an insane action, such insane Ooh. moments. Nearly had a heart attack, guys. I think everyone, as we heard the crowd, take a gasp 
as he went for the hug. We like, no, you cannot do this. But of course it's Ecar. I can't believe we I fell. Known. I can't we believe I fell yeah. for it. Yeah, I know. But no, that series overall, I mean, could we have asked for a better finals? Mm -hmm. I thought that was absolutely amazing. And the last game specifically was just so tense. I actually couldn't believe it. Every single draw towards the mm -hmm. last few turns was just swung the game yeah. either way. Yeah, yeah. Then, all the way back to like the nourish, right? Like yeah, the yeah, nourish yeah, yeah, yeah. changed everything, and then even every draw after that just made it go completely. Yeah, bad. and even <laughs> and here he is, our true silver champion E Cup with the trophy. Make sure you put it in the middle of the table. Middle of the table. There, there you go. go. <laughs> in one right, cup. That was the same. Just gonna get you mic'd up. Oh, oh. Uh, there we go. Got him. There we go. So, first of all, congratulations on the thank win. Thank you, thank you. I think we know, but how are you feeling right about now? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's all right. Yeah. It's reasonable. It's, it's, it's all right. It's okay, all right. you're trying to play it off cool <laughs> now, but we all saw you on, on, on stream yeah. there jump up. So, again, congratulations. How That series was incredibly tense. Uh, did it go overall? Not, we'll talk about the last game in a minute, but the overall series, did it go as expected? Or do you, you know, did you have a few hiccups in places? It went pretty much as expected. I mean, it's been the, the same story was shown in the finals as it was throughout the whole tournament for me, pretty much. A lot of my series were 3-2, very close matches. And uh, yeah, pretty much nail biters, except for like sometimes game five was just a stomp. But uh, yeah, kind of like this one, I guess. Okay, so or a, or a series against Naiman, for example. But yeah, uh, overall, very tense series, very close series, and um, yeah, very fun series as well. Okay, and in terms of your lineup, it was probably one of the more standard lineups we've seen overall in the tournament. What was the decision to go for? Yeah, I think we, we were discussing it before the match actually. More of a sort of lineup we've seen before versus being a bit more adventurous with the carries and cards. All right, so here's the thing: I uh, have played like absolutely. No games of Hearthstone uh, a week uh, like a week prior. A, a week prior uh, to this event was the last time I played. That's when I won um, a tournament at the Gamescom. And since then, I haven't played a single game of Hearthstone. So I basically didn't prepare at all, really. Okay. Yeah, so he got said to me before this tournament. It's like, yeah, someone told me that Arcane Giant was good in Yogdruid, so I put, I put it in. Just put it in. I figured it out myself, pretty much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, but yeah, uh, I didn't try to put any fancy barns into my decks or play some weird hunter lists or paladins or priests even. Just bring the standard stuff. Whatever is good, it's going to be good. Yeah, I mean, and, and we've been saying as well, like, we pretty much pegged you very early on as being one of the most consistent, like, playing well throughout the whole tournament. We've seen a lot of players make a few errors there, you know, here and there, yep. but we're straight away, we're like, okay, Ecop's actually playing extremely consistently, mm -hmm. so not too much of a surprise there. Have you got, guys got any more questions? I mean, straight away, I just want to say congrats on your, your commitment to trolling, honestly. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Wait, you're about to end. win a major and you pick up Yogg. Like, that is the ultimate yeah, the troll. My hat comes off to you, sir. Yeah, I just, well wa I just wanted to play a little bit to the crowd and yeah, to yeah. chat it worked. watching online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but seriously, well, like, you, know, you deserve it. You're a great guy. You've been around the scene forever. So like, you know, my heart goes out to you. Well done. You've, you've picked up your major win. So congratulations. Yeah, so congratulations again. You are the proud owner of that awesome trophy. And $10,000 is the first place prize. So got to be feeling pretty good. But yeah, that's yeah. going to be it awesome. now from the True Silver Championship here at Insomnia. So for myself, Subtle Life Coach, Ecop, the rest of the casters, the production, and all the admins. Thanks a lot, guys, and uh, we'll see you next time in Somnia 59. And one round of applause for Ecop. Yeah, absolutely. Also from the caster.